I'm Geraldo Rivera, and you're about to witness a live television event. A massive concrete vault has been discovered. Some think it belonged to none other than the notorious Al Capone. Well, tonight, for the first time, that vault is going to be open live. Live from the Windy City, Chicago, Illinois, a worldwide two-hour television event from Al Capone's former headquarters in the Lexington Hotel. Tribune Entertainment and the Westgate Group are proud to present The Mystery of Al Capone's Vaults. Brought to you by Stroh's and Stroh Light. Now you're talking good times and Stroh's is spoken here and by the Hyatt Regency of Chicago. The Mystery of Al Capone's Vaults is hosted by... Geraldo Rivera. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the old Lexington Hotel, where 60 years ago, during the height of the Roaring Twenties and Prohibition, this once lavish building belonged or was the headquarters for the notorious gangster Al Capone. Directly beneath me, in this hotel's rubble-strewn basement, a massive concrete chamber has been discovered, and there is evidence to suggest that that vault once belonged to Al Capone, the richest and most powerful gangster of his time. Now what, if anything, that vault contains, we don't know. This is an adventure you and I are going to be taking together because one way or the other, the mystery is going to be solved tonight. We're going to break open that vault, and we're going to step inside. We're also going to step back into history. The history of Chicago in the Roaring Twenties. It's a history written with the rapid fire of Tommy Gun, held by gangsters like Dion O'Banion, Jaime Weiss, Frank Nitti, and of course, the ruthless and cunning Scarface Al Capone. We'll show you how Capone used murder to carve out a multi-million dollar criminal empire. An empire based on illegal booze, prostitution, and gambling. We'll explore the private rooms, the secret passages, the hidden stairways of his once luxurious hotel headquarters. We'll descend 40 feet beneath the streets of Chicago into a vast and little known tunnel system. One that may have been used by Scarface Al Capone and his men. Here in Chicago, in Miami, in Los Angeles, and on San Francisco's Alcatraz Island, we'll talk to people who knew Al Capone personally. Capone was an evil man. He seemed like, just like a big roly-poly teddy bear to me. He was just like any other hoodlum. He was lovable. He was sweet. Who do you think murdered your husband? Al Capone then. The Lexington Hotel here on Michigan Avenue in Chicago's rough south side now resembles, as you can see, a bombed-out hulk. It's battered and crumbling after years of neglect. But this building, believe it or not, can claim a proud past. It has a notorious and colorful history. Its most infamous guest by far lived right up there in the fifth floor corner room. According to survivors of that era, he could be a genial, even charismatic guy quick with a joke and generous with a buck, but dominant was his dark side, his attraction to physical violence, his quick explosive temper, his ability to commit cold-blooded murder. He was, of course, Scarface Al Capone, America's public enemy number one. Now picture this hotel as it was when Al Capone lived here, truly an elegant and classy place. Hanging from the ornate ceilings were crystal chandeliers, while along these arched walls were fine art, lots of art. The floor was covered with ornate and beautiful tile mosaics. But Capone still transformed this place into a haven for crime and vice. For instance, in the lobby back there, armed men carrying Tommy guns were on patrol constantly. The fellow who ran the cigar stand out here was also the house bookmaker, always carrying a loaded 45 automatic in his waistband. Armed lookouts also monitored the elevators. Up in the floors of the hotel, there were brothels for Capone-controlled prostitutes and living quarters for his legion of armed men. 
in exploring this hotel, and believe me, we have climbed or crawled through the whole structure from the very top to the very bottom, we have found some fascinating things, like escape tunnels that the experts and eyewitnesses tell us were used by Capone and his men to split out of the hotel in the case of a raid by police or rival gangsters. There are also these hidden staircases. You can see them now only because we have torn the wall away, the walls that stood here until we began our process of excavation and exploration. There's another one over here, check it out. Look, a hidden staircase that Capone could use in the hotel, a raid happens, they come in the front door, he just came down this hidden staircase and then disappeared through a tunnel system that we'll show you later on. But over here is the main event. This is what you've come to see and this is why we're here this massive concrete chamber, which some believe was built for Al Capone. Look at this electric wiring, for example. We have spoken to the electrician who put, or rather the son of the electrician who installed this wiring. The man said that he was working for Al Capone at the time he did the job. And why would you need electricity in a sealed chamber? Now what, if anything, this vault contains, we have no idea. But we're going to find out tonight, because we're going to take this wall down. It's about 5,000 pounds. The concrete is 22 inches thick. It's coming down tonight. Now due to the thickness that seals the vault area, the thickness of the concrete, we have already pre-sawed through it and we prepared it to be pulled out. It was a difficult and time-consuming job that actually began several weeks ago. But now we are ready to tear this massive slab away, and we're going to do it with the help of a miniature bulldozer. Believe it or not, we've lowered one into the basement. They call these babies uh, bobcats. Right, bobcats. We're going to take the bobcat, we're going to hook it up to the chains, and we're going to pull this wall down. All right, guys, John, okay, Jim, let's hook it up. Now, as these fellows are hooking the chains up to the bobcat, we're going to take our first short commercial break. But don't go away, because when we come back, that wall's coming down. Okay, guys, let's do it. Get it set. Get it set. Okay, the, uh, the chains are hooked and the big slab's about to come down. But before we do that, let me give you just a little background about what we think we may have in here. Take a look. It begins with Tim Samuelson, an architectural expert with Chicago's Historical Landmark Society. Tim helped us explore the Lexington and confirmed that the vault, as well as the soil sample taken from a section of it, could have come from the period during which Al Capone occupied the hotel. Still, there were many unanswered questions. So, what do you think? Well, so now, in these old buildings, you see similar things. You just have to dig through and interpret the different layers. It's just all kind of stacked up and just have to sort it out. In January, we began sorting it out, carefully probing parts of the vaulted area, trying to determine how thick and formidable it would be. In February, experts used a heat-sensitive infrared monitor, trying to learn if the areas behind some of the sealed vault entrances were hollow or solid. Unfortunately, the readout suggested many of the areas were solid concrete. Still searching for hollow spaces, a seismic survey device, the kind often used in oil exploration, was used to bounce sound waves into the vault. But once again, the results indicated that much of the vault was solid. This disappointing evidence forced us to launch an exploration of selected parts of the vault. We had to know what we were up against. We encountered tons of dirt, and then occasionally an artifact dating from the time of Capone. The task of removing the dirt and backfill proved to be an enormous job. So a miniature bulldozer was partially dismantled and lowered into the basement. As our exploration progressed, cutting equipment became necessary. What we had hoped would be a simple and revealing survey had grown into a monumental task. It was a task worth performing. After countless hours of digging, we realized we'd discovered a promising vault within a vault. It was a sealed, self-contained 30-foot section, and our tests indicate it was probably hollow. So our excitement mounted. Come with me a second, let me show you what I was just describing. At first we thought the whole thing was 125-foot long space of just vault. This is the area, this cleared out space in here, uh, that turned out to be solid. We thought it was hollow at first, but this is the section that turned out to be packed solid. We've moved literally tons and tons of fill out of here. This is where we found the artifacts and other things. We've also, here Don, you can see up here, we've propped up the ceiling of this old hotel 
so it wouldn't fall down on us. We found some fascinating discoveries in here, like this space that I'll be showing you later on and similar secret spaces. But remember, this was the part of the, uh, the vaulted space that turned out to be packed solid. But over here, this is what I was describing as the chamber within a chamber, the vault within a vault, the section that our sonic and seismic tests indicated was probably hollow. Now this brick, for instance, has no structural reason for existing. It is here, it seems, uh, for one reason and one reason only, and that's to seal this space. This is our vault within a vault. This is where we're going to go in when we pull that slab down just in a really scant seconds, uh, a couple of minutes anyway. Now, Capone was the or, okay. Capone was the absolute lord and master of the Lexington Hotel between the years 1927 and 1932. That's when he went away to prison. When we dug out this solidly packed area of the vault, we found artifacts like this one that date back to that Capone era. That may be significant. We don't know. Also, that period between 27 and 32 represented Capone's golden era. That was at a time when his illicit booze operation, his gambling and his prostitution were netting him approximately $100 million every year. Remember, he didn't pay taxes, so Capone had a lot of money to hide. The intelligence unit of the Internal Revenue Service that was investigating Capone at that time, thank you, Joe, was quoted as saying, Capone's sources of income are known to us. We believe he could cash in for $20 million. This is back in the 20s rumor. $20 million. But where has he hidden it? End quote. So it's a long shot. But maybe those missing millions are what we'll find in here. Or maybe we'll find the bones of his criminal rivals, or maybe documents, or weapons, or bootleg booze paraphernalia. Who knows? I don't. Not even the IRS knows. Remember, when Capone finally went to prison, he didn't go to jail for any of the approximately 600 homicides he is allegedly responsible for. He went down, like so many of these hoods do, on an income tax evasion rep. And right now, here in Chicago, on the off chance that there is something great and there's something huge and something of value, the local tax man has shown up, Dennis Sansoni, special agent in charge of the IRS here. Dennis, I understand that your office has placed a lien against anything of value that we might find. Today. Right. We have a judgment for taxes that Capone owed in the late 20s and early 30s. Right now, with uh, tax penalty and interest, it's around $800,000. He owes $800,000. So you guys are here first in line right. in case we find anything. Right. Um, you know, we've been taking guesses. All the guys down here have their own personal opinions. We've been working, as you know, for months excavating this thing. Uh, about what we might find. Do you have any personal guess? Well, I think it might be prohibition paraphernalia, uh, stuff that uh, from the old uh, booze days, uh, possibly trucks, maybe some old cars. Okay, but the first $800,000 worth goes to the government. Right. Uncle Sam. Right. Okay, thanks, Thank Sam. You. Okay, over here, it looks like the slab that seals this mysterious vaulted area uh, is now ready to, uh, to come down. Just one word of caution before we pull it down. Our tests indicate that this is a very, very deep chamber. So don't expect to see gold bars right out front. It's probably not going to work that way. This concrete slab is probably the first obstacle we're going to encounter. OK, now, John, you guys ready? Everybody's awesome. ready? You said, Jimmy? OK, OK, Rich. OK, uh, without further ado, let's take the wall down. Let's go. Take it down. Let's go. Let's go. Take it down. Okay, watch yourself, John. Yeah. Take it down. Here it down. Okay, it's about like we figured this. Fill in the uh, in the beginning areas. It's got uh, other, you know, it's 20s junk. Definitely 20s junk. Let's see what's in there, though. The electrical wires go back inside. Okay, start digging it out. Come on, bring that bulldozer. Let's get this stuff out of here. I was uh, made a mistake. Here, hold the bottom. All right, now. <laughs> This thing goes forever. The vault that we've indicated as being basically hollow stretches forever, so the only way we're gonna get inside and empty this place out before our two hours are up, we're starting uh, another team of workers here. So we've brought out the heavy artillery. When we come back, the excavation work is going to continue. Stay tuned because one way or another, the secret is now being uncovered. Okay, let's go, Winston. Let's go. The mystery of Al Capone's vaults will continue after these messages. I think uh, 
Uh, it's a prohibition gin. It's a Capone's bathtub gin. Now, before we totally enter what was, well, what may have been Capone's private space, I think that this is an appropriate time. I hope you can hear me for us to find out more about this guy. Scarface Al Capone didn't just control the Lexington Hotel. At one point, he controlled the entire American underworld. And in a perverted, bizarre kind of way, I guess you could say his was a success story. The story of America's most notorious gangster began with the wave of Italian immigrants who flooded into New York City before the turn of the century. Among that overwhelmingly honest and hardworking group were Gabriel and Teresa Capone, two refugees from the slums of Naples. The family settled amid the poverty of Brooklyn with hopes for a better future. The fourth of their nine children, born in 1899, was christened Alphonse Capone. He was the bad seed. By the time he was 18 years old, the young man's face was already scarred from a barroom knife fight. He was also suspected by New York police of at least two murders. By then, he was known to friend and foe alike as Al Capone. In the fall of 1919, young Al was summoned to Chicago. The call came from Johnny Torrio, a former New York gang leader who was Capone's close friend and teacher. A brilliant criminal mastermind with vaulting ambition, Johnny Torrio felt he needed a loyal and trusted assistant. With the heat on him in New York, Al Capone was only too happy to make the move to Chicago. At the time, Torrio was in business with his uncle, a fun-loving, high-living mobster called Big Jim Colosimo. Colosimo owned and operated a popular night spot, patronized by some of Chicago's best-known and most influential citizens. Colosimo also controlled most of Chicago's prostitution and vice, and a brand new, far more lucrative criminal opportunity loomed just over the horizon. Though four out of five Chicagoans opposed, booze was about to become illegal. Alcohol is hindering the coming of world peace because it is befuddling the thinking of humanity. It is no laughing matter today when the National Survey of Education in, on Alcoholism states that six out of, that one out of every six boozers are women. As the inaugural day of the National Prohibition Act drew ever closer, many Americans went into a drinking frenzy, loading up on the last of their illegal drinks. Then the party was over. On January 17, 1920, liquor became illegal and the nation went dry. Ironically, it was Al Capone's 21st birthday. The first recorded violation of prohibition took place in Chicago, only minutes after the new law went into effect. A shipment of medicinal alcohol was hijacked from a railroad yard. It was the first evidence the great experiment was going to become a grandiose disaster. Whose idea was this anyway? Well, here is Frances Willard, founder of one of the most powerful lobbying groups in the country at that time, the Women's Christian Temperance Union. We well, may be surprised to know that the international organization is still alive and well, and living here in Evanston, Illinois. It's a suburb of Chicago where until just a year ago, liquor stores were still illegal. I came here recently to visit Martha Egger, the current president of the WCTU, to ask her about a historical irony. Quote, the American people had expected to be greeted when the great day came by a covey of angels bearing gifts of peace, happiness, and prosperity. Instead, they were met by hordes of bootleggers, gangsters, trigger men, venal judges, corrupt police, crooked politicians, and speakeasy operators. Do you think there's any linkage between prohibition, the 18th Amendment, those years between 1920 and 1933 when it was the law of the land and growth of organized crime, the rackets? <laughs> I think organized crime has been here with us you know, for a long time. I don't think you can lay it at Prohibition's door. Uh, some other thing would have been blamed for it if it hadn't been for Prohibition. Despite the pure intentions of its sponsors to Johnny Torrio and his criminal protege Al Capone, Prohibition represented the irresistible money-making opportunity of a lifetime. Torrio pleaded with Colosimo to exploit it, but Big Jim showed little interest. His clubs, brothels, and gambling houses were already earning enough profits. And besides, he had a new young wife demanding all his extra attention. It proved a deadly distraction. 
What more can a man want, eh? The best of everything. A Hollywood movie starring Rod Steiger as Al Capone presented a fanciful version of Colosimo's murder. You know it, eh? Colosimo was killed by an anonymous bullet fired through the window of his club. The king of Chicago's vice would be buried in grand style. On May 11, 1920, less than four months after the start of Prohibition, Big Jim Colosimo bit the dust. His murderer was never found, but the principal suspect was Al Capone. After a grand gangland funeral attended by all, Big Jim was laid to rest in this tomb, befitting his status as the former head of Chicago vice. His death marks the beginning of a bold new criminal era, one in which Johnny Torrio and Al Capone would revolutionize the underground, introducing business procedures and making it all frighteningly efficient. In many ways, the death of Big Jim Colosimo marked the birth of modern organized crime. We are now on the second floor of what once was the elegant ballroom of the Lexington Hotel. The guys are still digging furiously down below in the basement, but we thought that you would like to hear how this long-dead gangster, Al Capone, is still affecting our nation's life in a very, very negative way. With me now is Patrick Healy. Patrick is the executive director of the Chicago Crime Commission, and welcome. Thank you for joining my pleasure. us tonight. Have you ever seen a bottle of uh, bathtub gin before? That was before my time. <laughs> a little before mine, too. <laughs> I'm going to keep these as souvenirs. hope we find a lot more down there. I said that uh, in the video piece we just saw that Capone was the the real godfather of organized crime. Can that be said with accuracy in your oh, experience? Oh, I think so. I think he saw the potential of a, of a unified organization, and therefore he made those come under his control, and those who did not, he killed or ran out of town. So he made a monopoly in essence? Absolutely. He was uh, what we would call modern, modern business techniques to organize crime activities. Tell me about that. Tell me how he organized, organized crime. Well, it's one of those things that you either do it my way or else. And that's why you had so much violence and street battles in Chicago at the time. And at one time before he came here, or slightly after he came here, we had pockets of gangs. And they each had sections of town. Well, they were working at odds with each other. And if you're really going to take over a town, you must control the town. He saw that and did it to, to a, a high degree of proficiency. Yeah, you mentioned a high degree. We uh, estimated from our historical research, uh, research, et cetera, that he was bringing in $100 million a year, which seems a fabulous amount. How does that compare with modern organized crime? Today's standards, it's uh, nickels and dimes. Today's standards, organized crime is estimated to bring in $100 billion dollars a year. Billion. The President's Commission on Organized Crime forecasted a hundred billion dollars and 414,000 jobs a year. Oh my goodness, that looks like uh, what, a thousand business. times more than uh, Capone. Okay, Patrick, thank you for coming with us. I'd like you to, to hang in in case we find some artifacts that are in your uh, area of expertise. My pleasure. You know, thanks for the answer so far. We're still in the process of removing dirt from the vault down below. We have to pause now for another commercial break, but when we come back, you'll get acquainted with an indispensable tool of the 1920s, the Tommy gun, after these commercial messages. This big second floor room in the Lexington Hotel was basically the gangster's gymnasium, but it also had a more sinister purpose. This was the target practice range for Capone and the boys. And during that time, what better weapon to hit what you were aiming at than this one, the Thompson submachine gun. Most civilians call it the Tommy gun. The mob called it the typewriter. And as you know, with it, they wrote a bloody tale of terror. If the Colt was the weapon that won the West, they say this was the weapon that made the 20s roar. With me now are two experts on the Thompson submachine gun specifically and weapons. Come on in, guys. Here's Sherman Tarnoff and Bill Dambra. Why was the weapon so popular with the mob? Well, it was so popular because it was probably the first weapon designed for automatic fire. It was designed by uh, Colonel Thompson during the First World War. Uh, the main reason was the fact that it was a type of a trench war and that it was impossible to fire at many troops at one time. So the gun was actually developed and its original name was called the Trench Broom. 
The trench broom, how appropriate. Why did the mob like it? Because it had a tremendously high rate of fire, it had a devastating effect when hitting uh, people. But what about accuracy? It was tremendously accurate, a very accurate weapon at close ranges. I've shot most modern weapons. I haven't used this one yet. Uh, is it difficult to fire? No, it's a very easy weapon to fire. It has very little rise. It is extremely accurate, and it's very comfortable to shoot. Okay, why don't we... Uh... Why don't we demonstrate that? You can walk me through it. We'll show the, uh, the rate of fire and the accuracy of the Thompson submachine gun. Okay. We've set up some targets. Why don't you load her up and show me how to use it? Okay. What's your caliber? It's a 45 caliber automatic pistol round. Is this exactly the same gun used in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre? Exactly. Weapon loaded? Weapon's loaded and it's on safe. She's on safe. Okay, okay, I mark. Any special instructions? Just lean into it. Okay. Safety's coming off. Safety's off. Weapons hot. Down range. Ready. They also use this thing with the stock off, didn't they? Yes, they did. It comes off real simple, just like Why? that. Why? What's the reason for that? The reason they took the stock off was so that they could go out the window of a car uh -huh. and it would be convenient. That way it wouldn't get in their way. I see. Now, one point I want to make very clearly right now, this is live ammunition. It's not like the cop shows you see on TV, not like the police dramas where they use squibs or blanks. This is the real stuff. 45 real stuff. caliber, hot ammunition. Okay. Now you just fire it like a pistol. Then. Safety's pistol. on. She's hot. Downrange. Okay. Ready to go. Ready to go. Okay, let's see what happens to Aristotle. So I just watch my burst and aim by the watch burst. Watch your burst where it's going. The mystery of Al Capone's vaults will continue after these messages. Just a few miles west of downtown Chicago and the Lexington Hotel lies Cicero. In 1923, the year the Chicago Crime Commission named Al Capone public enemy number one, Cicero was a quiet middle-class suburb, but that didn't last for long. 1923 was also the year Chicago got a new mayor. Big Bill Thompson was finally replaced by a law and order reformer, a man named William Deaver. Deaver appointed as chief of police an incorruptible lawman, Morgan Collins by name. When Capone offered him $100,000 a month not to interfere with his Chicago activities, Collins answered by raiding Capone's speakeasies, brothels, gambling dens, and breweries, and by arresting scores of his men. Confronted for the first time by an untouchable mayor and an incorruptible police chief, Capone quickly realized that he needed a safe haven. He chose nearby Cicero. On that lot once stood the Hawthorne Inn. It was Capone's Cicero headquarters, complete with armor-plated walls and bulletproof steel shutters. From here, Capone ran his Chicago operations. He also converted Cicero from a once peaceful community into a center of vice and violence. It wasn't long before Cicero could boast 150 gambling establishments, most of them featuring slot machines and roulette. There are also 125 saloons and speakeasies and a string of brothels stretching from one end of town to the other. The cost, in case you're interested, was $2 for every five minutes or fraction thereof. It may not sound like a lot of money, but it was enough to earn Capone an estimated $10 million a year. Cicero's mayor, a corrupt mobster puppet named Joseph Z. Klenhoff, was re-elected to office in 1924 only because a 200-man army of Capone's thugs and torpedoes intimidated, terrorized, and physically assaulted any Cicero citizen who wouldn't cast his ballot for Klenhoff. In Cicero, Al Capone was the undisputed boss of bosses. No one dared oppose him, except one man. One man who dared to be a thorn in his side. He was a newspaper editor, actually the youngest in the country at the time, just 21 years old. And he waged an unrelenting war of words against Al Capone and the corrupt Cicero city government. That newspaper editor is now the distinguished author and journalist, Robert St. John. Welcome. You exposed one of Capone's brothels in a quite unique way. That was where all my trouble began. One evening I armed myself with a pocket full of five and ten dollar bills. 
I knew the fee was $5, but I was going to use the $10 for a different purpose. When I got upstairs, I uh, gave the girl the $5 bill, which was always paid in advance. And then I said, now, sister, we're going to uh, have a little talk. Here's $10 extra for just talking. Anyway, all night long, I was passed along from one girl to another. When my $10 bills were all gone, um, one of the girls came rushing in and said, my God, Ralph is at the bottom of the staircase. Ralph Capone. Ralph Capone. Al's brother. Al's brother. His who, enforcer. Um, one of the girls uh, showed me how going through a toilet I could uh, jump out the window onto a lean-to and uh, get away, which I did. To tell us more about his Cicero adventures, Robert St. John returned to his old neighborhood after an absence of more than half a century. One morning, as I was on my way to my office in Cicero, I'd just come from my home in Oak Park. There was one cop standing on this corner right here. Then there was another Cicero policeman on that corner over there. My office was where that vacant lot is. Uh, as I started across the street like this, I got right to the center here, right to the middle, when I heard the screech of brakes. And I looked up, and in that direction was a black, seven-passenger black touring car. Uh, this is the type of car that both the private detectives, the uh, plainclothes detectives, and the gangsters used. I knew it was one of the two. When I saw four guys pile out, I knew which it was because I recognized the first man that came out as Ralph Capone. So I knew I was in for it. So I immediately curled up right here in the middle of this intersection, right on the ground with my head buried because I didn't want to get it in the head. As I lay there in the middle of the intersection with the cops on the two corners, uh, they worked over me with blackjacks. Didn't you say there were two policemen on either corner? Two policemen on either corner, and neither of them lifted a finger to uh, stop what had happened or to chase the, uh, the gang. I guess that's more symptomatic than anything of what Cicero was really like. That is absolutely correct. That was Cicero. As soon as I got out of the hospital, I came right here to the Cicero Police Department. Chief of Police was Ted Svoboda, a good friend of mine. I said, Ted, I want four warrants charging assault with intent to kill, assault and battery, kidnapping, and so forth. I want warrants for Ralph Capone, Pete Pizak, and two John Doe warrants. He put his arm around my shoulder and said, kid, you're too young to die. Forget it. I said, no, Ted, I want those warrants. He said, come back at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. At 9 o'clock the next morning, I came back. He said, go up to my uh, office up on the second floor. Uh, he said, I'll be right up. I went upstairs. I was looking out the window when I heard the door close. I turned around and there stood a man, big, stocky fellow with a scar on the left side of his face. Of course, I knew who it was. He uh, came toward me, held out his hand. I did not take it. He said, I'm sorry, kid. I'm sorry it happened. The boys were drunk. They know better than that. Well, he pulled out of his pocket a roll, the biggest roll of bills I've ever seen. They weren't fives and tens like mine. They were hundreds. And he started peeling them off. He said, you lost your hat. You, uh, you, your hospital bill is paid. And he's peeling off these $100 bills. You take the money? There were times later that I almost wished I had. Uh, I, I've had rough times in my life. So 60 years, six decades later, how does it feel being back in Sicily? Well, actually, uh, I don't want to be sacrilegious, but uh, it is a sort of a reincarnation, rebirth. I suddenly feel instead of 85, I feel 25 again, which was what I was when I was last in this town. As you know, the Capones are all buried deep in the ground, but St. John, who lost his first big war against the gangsters of Cicero, St. John is still alive and doing well. I'll say. Thank you very much. Okay, a great man, Robert St. John. The, uh, the Adams Express Company, talking about six decades ago, has just checked into our 
excavation process. We've hit an obstacle back there, but don't worry, we have some drastic remedies to take care of it. Stay tuned. We're going to uh, we're going to continue this search after these commercial messages. The mystery of Al Capone's vaults will continue. We've all seen it in the news reports and in the movies. It seems every time there's a gangland murder, the casket of the murdered mobster is adorned with spectacular floral arrangements. Flowers and murder. It must be a gangland tradition. Well, on this site back in the 1920s stood one of the mob's favorite suppliers. William Schoenfeld's flower shop was partly owned by a deceptively good-natured Irishman named Dion O'Banion. Deany to his friends, he was apparently one of his own best customers. You see, O'Banion, the flower shop owner, was also O'Banion, the killer. After a youth spent in this neighborhood perfecting such skills as hijacking, safe cracking, arm robbery, and finally contract murder, O'Banion and his gang had become one of Al Capone's most deadly rivals. He and his boys controlled most of Chicago's north side, and they actually posed a threat to Al Capone's master plan of controlling Chicago's entire underworld. On November 10, 1924, Dion O'Banion was in his flower shop, doing next to murder what he loved doing best. He was arranging a lovely bouquet of roses to adorn the casket of a recently murdered mob chieftain. He never got to the ribbons. Just as he was putting the finishing touches on that bouquet of roses, Dini O'Banion was blown away by three of Al Capone's torpedoes. For three days, O'Banion's body lay at the Sabarbaro Funeral Home. Then on the fourth, it was buried in the grandest gangland funeral Chicago had ever seen. O'Banion's funeral cortege featured 26 cars. Naturally, they were adorned with tons of flowers. There were 10,000 mourners, including some of Chicago's most important politicians and high-ranking police officials. The bizarre spectacle marked the beginning of Capone's violent struggle to take control of this city. That struggle was aided by Chicago's political machine. Mayor William E. Deaver, whose tough anti-mob tactics had forced Capone to take refuge in Cicero, was voted out of office. The corrupt administration of Mayor Big Bill Thompson was now back in power. And it wasn't long before Al Capone was welcome back in Chicago. Capone and Torrio began aggressively to expand their criminal empire, but they faced violent opposition. With Dion O'Banion dead, a fiery young Pole named Jaime Weiss had taken over control of the Northside Irish gang. And he wanted territory and power as badly as Capone and Torrio did. He also wanted revenge. Shortly after O'Banion was buried, Al Capone's car was sprayed with bullets and a chauffeur wounded. Capone ordered a bulletproof Cadillac limousine, only to have his new chauffeur kidnapped, tortured, and ultimately killed. On January 23, 1925, Johnny Torrio and his wife were coming home from an afternoon shopping when Jaime Weiss and the boys struck again. Mrs. Torrio had already gone into their apartment right here. Johnny Torrio was hanging out on the sidewalk when three men approached from a Cadillac limousine parked on the corner. They fired a salvo of bullets at Johnny Torrio, hitting him three times. Once in the jaw, once in the chest, another time in the groin. Torrio fell right about here. At that point, one of the hitmen ran up to him with his pistol drawn to administer the coup de grace. But as he pressed the pistol to Torrio's head, he clicked it. The weapon was empty. Miraculously, Torrio would survive. But he found it prudent at that point to retire. But before he left, he signed over his share of the brothel, the gambling establishments, and the speakeasies to Al Capone. Scarface now controlled a criminal empire worth tens of millions of dollars. He was just 26 years old. Cicero had become a rich prophet. Oh, oh, oh. oh, oh. Don't worry, we're gonna, we're gonna take that thing down. We sort of half expected it'd be there. We're gonna take it down, don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> okay, go to work, guys. All right, now, Al, Al Capone's success, excuse me. Al Capone's success, and let's back up, they won't be able to hear me. Al Capone's success in avoiding arrest and prosecution lay in large part, let's keep backing up, they won't hear me, on his ability to, uh, to bribe, uh, to bribe the, the cops. But finally, in uh, 1928, the U.S. Treasury Department assigned a 26-year-old incorruptible special agent. One task and one task alone, and that was getting Capone. I'm sure you'll remember this, but actor Robert Stack brought him into all of our living rooms. The agent's name was Elliot Ness, a man whose bold exploits were made famous by the popular television series, The Untouchables.
Elliot Ness's bold raids on Capone breweries and other enterprises cost the gangster millions of dollars. And indeed, Ness's work led to 5,000 criminal counts against Scarface Al Capone. And yet many law-abiding Chicagoans didn't have a very high regard for Elliot Ness. Chicago crime photographer Tony Berardi, for instance, still has a very strong point of view. Elliot Ness, you know, would call us up and say, we'll meet you at a certain, certain place at a certain, certain time, and uh, we'd be there. Uh, he, they'd break up a couple of barrels for us just to show that they were on the job. And Let me ask you this. Who'd you like better, Elliot Ness or Al Capone? Al Capone. How come? Because I knew what Al Capone was, Elliot Ness. I, he was just a publicity hound in my book. He was a, a messenger boy. I get a great kick up when I see those untouchables. My God, he never fired a gun in his life. No, I haven't got too much to say about him. So you still like Capone? Wait a minute. I liked Al Capone as a newsman. Personally, I hated his guts. I come from an Italian family. There's between 15 and 20 million Italians in this country. And there's probably 2,000 bums out of those 20 million. If it was up to me, I would take those 2,000 bums, put them in Soldier's Field in Chicago, get me another Jack McGurn and blow them down. That's how much I like Al Capone. Whoa, okay. Can you guess what we have planned for that wall? Well, you'll find out when you come back after these commercial messages. Don't go away. The fun is just beginning. Welcome back to the basement of the Lexington Hotel. I'll give you a hint about what's going on there. Those fellows are explosives experts. More about that in a second. First, I want to give you a little bit more history. Even though drinking was theoretically outlawed during Prohibition, that didn't stop millions of Americans from indulging in their favorite pastime. Take a look. Just six months after Prohibition began, a brand new American institution was born, the Speakeasy. Still around today, the Green Mill was one of the most stylish and popular of the more than 20,000 speakeasies in the Chicago area alone. Because of clubs like the Green Mill, the sweet sounds of jazz, like the harsh rattle of Tommy guns, became one of the hallmarks of the Roaring Twenties. For a time, Al Capone owned the Green Mill, and he and his fellow mobsters at the other speakeasies had no trouble at all attracting and keeping top-name talent, like Franz Jackson, Earl Hines, and Cab Calloway. Former band leader and now jazz historian Dempsey Travis told me exactly how Scarface Al did it, how he kept the loyalty of his performers. This is what happened when Joey Lewis tried to leave. Right here at the Green Mill, uh, uh, Joey Lewis, I mean, uh, singer, comedian, uh, big time artist, and uh, somebody offered him a, a $1,000 a week as compared to the $650 a week he was making at the Green Mill and uh, he accepted it. Uh, three weeks after he left, uh, some guys knocked on his door one night, three fellas to be exact, and uh, attempted to cut his throat from ear to ear and take off part of his tongue. And so it took from the late 40s to early 50s, I mean, I guess from 1941, 42 to 50s before he really gained his, his, his national popularity back again. but They uh, cut his tongue? They cut his tongue. So he wouldn't sing for anyone? He wouldn't else. sing, he couldn't talk. All he could do was make motions with his hands. So yes, they were bad boys. Bad boys. Bad boys. Right okay, guys, uh, as you can see, we have a, encountered a very substantial obstacle. It's a limestone wall. We semi-suspected it because there are limestone walls on both sides. Now, uh, what we're going to do is uh, something fairly radical. Come on, Don, let's get out of here. Uh, here's Sherwin uh, Tarnoff, the man who uh, taught me how to use the Tommy gun. He's also an explosives expert. He's working with uh, Dennis, which is Dennis. OK, <laughs> take it easy. Stay here. And uh, what was it again? I'm oh, sorry, Jerry, right, sorry. OK, they're both uh, explosives experts. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to take that wall down with a carefully controlled, prepared explosive. Tell me about it, Sean. We're going to use 60% uh, dynamite sticks. We're going to use two sticks located at the bottom of the wall. 
The holes are drilled in about 36 inches. We're going to pack them in. They're packing them in sand right now. We're going to shoot the charge. It's going to lift the wall up and then cause the fall forward into the room. Okay, uh, I'm all for it. I want to get the wall down and see what's behind it. But I'm curious about uh, one slight uh, detail. This is a 90-year-old building. It's older than 90 years, 95 almost. Um, what's the chances that the explosion will take the whole building down? Well, the problem is here that the wall that we're working on happens to be beyond the foundation of the building. It's actually under the sidewalk near the street area. So it has nothing to do with the foundation wall. Okay, now, uh, what is that putty stuff I see in here? Don, come in with me. Look at that. That's the whole stuff. That's just, you, you sort of just cemented in there? Yeah. Charges in place. Okay. Uh, and what are the, uh, the black bottle things? Those are part of the charges. Okay, those are charges. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, when we uh, come back, we're gonna, you gotta clear the basement now, everybody. Clear the basement out. Let's go, everybody upstairs. When we come back uh, from this commercial break, um, we're gonna blow that wall up. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Okay, clear the basement. Come on, everybody out. The mystery of Al Capone's vaults will continue after these messages. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Doug Llewellyn, and while Geraldo is busy preparing to blast the vault at the Lexington, we are here about 25 blocks north of the Lexington at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in downtown Chicago, where a gigantic Al Capone safe-cracking party is underway. A party with hundreds of people here to watch this show and to roam about a lot of Al Capone era memorabilia, such as this uh, 1929 Model A Ford. It was a police car, typical of the police cars that roamed the uh, streets of Chicago while Al Capone was here in power. As I think you will be able to see in a couple of minutes, a lot of people are dressed a la the 1920s. <laughs> You've got your guard. Everybody having a good time here? Yeah! I think they're having a grand time. Among other things, for these folks to see, Michael Yor Graham has brought his very extensive, very valuable collection of Al Capone era memorabilia. Michael, what is that in your hand? It is a blackjack, and um, allegedly it was used by Al Capone. And that's just one of how many items do you have relating to Capone? 1,600. Uh, 1,600 prohibition and Capone. As you can see, he's really into uh, collecting things regarding Al Capone. Obviously, the big question on everybody's mind is what is in the vault? It's a question we put to people all over the country, and here are some samples of their opinions. Now watch. I don't think they'll find anything but bones down there. Probably paraphernalia from the... Uh prohibition. They won't find a lot of jury. I do think there's money there. No, I don't think they'll find any money in there. We will find something in there of some significance. There may be uh, a body or two or some evidence of something. Probably it'll be an empty vault. The vault allows to tell a lot of stories. All right, those are some sample opinions from people not only here in Chicago, but all across the country. I thought very quickly we'd take a random survey here. You're dressed a la the Capone era, the 20... What do you think's in the bowl? Gosh, I don't know. Time will tell. Take a guess. Gosh, I don't know. How about you, sir? Well, I probably think there's bones in there. You think bones? I think there's yes, bones Yes, sir, what do you think? Cash, definitely. Cash, cash, cash. What do you think? Take it to Hawaii. Take it to Hawaii. All right. A sample of opinion of what people think. One more. How about you, sir? What do you think? Prohibition era stuff. Prohibition. And you, sir? Oh, I'd say a little cash. I haven't heard anybody say an awful lot of money. I think a lot of money. So let's go back now. We will be back at the Lexington to blow the vault right after these messages. The mystery of Al Capone's vaults will continue after these messages. Brought to you by Nice and Easy from Clairol. We're just about 30 seconds away from uh, being ready to blow the limestone wall that has blocked our progress into the, uh, into the vault space. Sure, why come around in here? Uh, you guys ready? Clear down here. All right, now you have something else to wire up? Come on, let's do it. Let's do it on live TV. <laughs> okay, you set? Okay, what's going to happen now? So now they're going to wire up the main unit and wire the DuPont box to the unit, and they'll be ready to, and you'll be ready to blow it. Okay, Wayne, just take a shot of this right here. Uh, Billy, put it on. You got it? Okay, camera forward. Look at this. This is, all right, uh, take a good shot of that, Wayne. This is a Capone-era plunger. We thought it would be appropriate to, uh, to use something dating back to old Scarface Al's day. Um, we're about ready to, uh, to go. 
was a moment of some drama. Got our hard hats on. Uh, okay, you guys set? Are all set? Okay. Uh, clear. Okay. What's the uh, what's the uh, classic phrase? Fire in the hole! Fire in the hole! I think, it, I think it worked. What happens now, Sure. Now they're going to go there and check to see if there's any live uh, dynamite left that might have blown out of the wall. If they check that and everything's okay, then it'll be all clear. Okay, so when you guys uh, search for uh, duds uh, and we begin sorting yeah. through all this, now we've blown down one wall. We have, uh, we've pulled oh. down another. Uh, we're, we're digging in. We're getting there. <laughs> we're finding out what's happening. The mystery of Al Capone's vault is being solved one way or the other. Yeah. Now, remember... There's a lot of mysteries. We're coming to you live from Chicago. Chicago is a city rich in familiar landmarks. The Water Tower, Wrigley Field, The Loop. This is City Hall. Far beneath this building, deep in the bowels of this city, there's another landmark. It's not as well known as the others, but I think you'll find it very impressive. Come on. We're now in the sub-basement of City Hall. We're three stories underground, but we're not there yet. We still have further to go. Okay, we've reached our goal. As you can see, it's a tunnel. Actually, it's a 60-mile network of tunnels, an incredible underground labyrinth that crisscrosses the entire downtown Chicago area. Come with me now on a tour of this subterranean maze. Look at this place. It took 11 years to build it back at the turn of the century. Its original purpose was part of an underground telephone system, but over the years it found other uses, some legitimate. Apparently, some not. The first change was the installation of railroad-type tracks. Here, maybe you can see them down here. Now, these were put in for an electric train system. The electric trains were used to deliver freight and coal to buildings throughout the loop section of downtown Chicago. The temperature down in these tunnels is a constant 50 degrees, which made this system of delivery a great way to beat the tough Chicago winter. But check it out. This system goes forever. So what do these tunnels have to do with Al Capone? Well, these are just theories, but think about them. I think they hold water. Back during Prohibition, wouldn't this tunnel system have been an ideal place to store huge quantities of bootleg booze? And what better way to deliver it throughout the city? And there's more. The official surveys show that this system of tunnels extended to within five blocks of Al Capone's headquarters in the Lexington Hotel. The rumors around Chicago for half a century are that this system of tunnels was in some way connected to a secret Capone-built tunnel or other underground passageway. No wonder poor Elliot Ness could never catch Scarface Al at home. If these rumors are correct, as soon as the alarm bell went off, Scarface Al would simply disappear underground. My dad uh, worked for Al Capone for many years, and during that time he uh, experienced uh, doing some work down here in the tunnels uh, that ran to various sporting houses and gambling houses uh, in the area. Well, I don't believe the police even knew where some of those tunnels were because they would, they would stage a raid and uh, before they could get the doors open, the guys were, were into to a building three, three buildings away. We searched for four months for some connecting link between this place, the tunnels in the hotel, and those city-owned tunnel system was frustrating and it was in vain. And finally, in early April, we did discover a clue that made us want to go and explore further. Check it out. It wasn't a simple job, but in light of the urban archaeology we'd already performed at the hotel and around the neighborhood, we weren't surprised. We'd become accustomed to the time-consuming process of breaking up tons of old brick and concrete. 
of gradually peeling back layers of history. Well, after hours of digging, we began to get a sense of being on the verge of a discovery. The bricks, for instance, were giving way more easily, and they seemed to be sealing up what was once a secret tunnel entrance. Well, we dug on, and our hunch proved correct. We had discovered what looked like an unknown tunnel. It was filled with dirt, but it was completely intact, and it seemed part of a large and complex tunnel system. Okay, I'm going to show you the secret tunnel, a legitimate find that we found after these commercial messages. We'll be right back. Stay there. The mystery of Al Capone's vaults will continue. Welcome back. I'm uh, Geraldo Rivera, now standing in the only quiet place in this whole hotel, the northeast corner of the basement, where about two weeks ago we discovered a secret tunnel system. Now, here, this is the wall we took down, and this is the tunnel. If you notice up there, it's the brick and mortar construction. This is a real secret tunnel, and it's certainly big enough for Capone and his boys to use uh, when they wanted to get out of the hotel in a real hurry. Take a look at it. You know, some, this was also all filled with uh, that backfill that we're finding out in the front side. But look at the ceiling. It's obvious that this was once a hollow space. This was uh, a tunnel. Now, is, do you have a flashlight out there? Is there a flashlight there? Oh, I'll be right back. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Uh, I want to show you something back here. We blasted this limestone wall also. Uh, we found another tunnel. It's hard to see now because the city has, in the intervening years, put gas and electrical uh, fixtures, so we can't get in there all the way. But this was definitely a tunnel at one time. Where my flashlight beam is now hitting used to be, in the 1930s, a Walgreens drugstore next door to the Lexington Hotel. Now, let me tell you why that's significant. A short time ago, a retired Chicago police officer named Matt Leahy told us his father was a bartender here at the Lexington Hotel, incidentally, during Capone's era. He told us that whenever there was a raid, Capone would use a staircase. Wayne, back up. Let me just uh, show the folks the staircase. And maybe you can just peek, peek back here. I should have showed it before we got in there. But Capone used this staircase leading down from the second floor to go into a secret tunnel that led into the Walgreens drugstore uh, just next door to the Lexington Hotel. So we think that with that eyewitness testimony, with the obvious brick and mortar construction and the care that someone and the expense someone has used, and the fact that it does go to the building that was the Walgreens department store, we can say that uh, we've discovered one of Capone's secret tunnels. Uh, and I'm sure that, you know, I, I was just thinking that maybe they should convert the Lexington Hotel into a kind of gangster museum after this, uh, this program is over. If the walls of this old place could talk, I'm sure that uh, they'd have a lot of uh, secrets to tell us. The Lexington truly is a, a fascinating relic. When I first came here, back in January of this year, aside from the fact that the place was absolutely freezing, I made some fascinating discoveries. I mean, at least for myself. This place feels like a tomb. The Lexington Hotel was built in 1891. This building's more than 90 years old, but somehow coming in here, it feels a lot, feels a lot older than that. Coming in here, you feel like an archaeologist. I learned later the hotel had been slated for demolition. You wonder what it must have been like in those days. Those arches. It is absolutely freezing. The hotel was saved from destruction by the organization which now owns both the building and presumably whatever is found in the vault. That is, once the IRS takes a chair. That organization is called the Sunbow Foundation. Established to train unemployed minority women in the construction trades. Its director is Pat Porter. We're the largest in the nation. And I pulled this together because of the high level of poverty for women and children in the nation, and especially here in Chicago, being 90% of the welfare population. And we were feeling that government programs were wasting too much money, tax money, that they were not being run effectively that in order for women, especially black women, to be able to support themselves and their children, that they would have to make more than $5 an hour in a typing job. So we decided to pull together a program that would be a year's worth of pre-apprenticeship 
that would actually teach these women how to go out and make the kind of money that a construction worker makes. Uh, laborers here make $13.90 an hour in benefits, and that's enough money to take a whole family off the system. So we decided to do a year's pre-apprenticeship. And so far, out of 150 women, we have an 88% placement and retention rate, which is higher than most programs around the nation. Once trained, the women could play a vital role in rehabilitating this building. We hope to rehab the Lexington into a luxury hotel that will accommodate the new McCormick Place expansion, which is our big convention center. The International Women's Museum and Research Center will go in and go up through the core. We'll dome that and uh, it will be an income producing property. One of the most intriguing things about digging out this old hotel in search of Al Capone has been the secrets that the search has so far yielded. Passageways, doorways, stairways, that kind of thing. This, for instance, in the old pictures was a mirror. But then when the mirror was removed, and in the older photographs, this was a doorway, a hidden doorway. So this is ground zero. This was the big man's office, room 530, here in the Lexington Hotel. It was from right in here, sitting behind a great big mahogany desk with his back to the window overlooking Michigan Avenue that Al Capone ran his criminal empire. Against these walls, he had canvas bags with padlocks on them, stuffed with cash, cash that was ready for deposit in any one of his numerous secret bank accounts. Now on these walls, he had portraits of three of his heroes, the first two are pretty standard, Abe Lincoln, George Washington. Then he also had one of Big Bill Thompson. Thompson was Chicago's hard-drinking mayor, a man whose political machine was kept well-greased with graft from Capone and the other criminal empires. In this corridor outside his office, Capone had stationed his bodyguards and some of his other henchmen, while in the rooms on this floor and those above and below lived Capone's torpedoes, his lieutenants, his drivers, his sluggers, his lookouts, as well as a large complement of the young prostitutes that Scarface favored for himself and the boys. At the end of the hall is a bulletproof door with no outside handle. It led to another Al Capone mystery. This disaster area on the third floor was apparently the big man's dining room, a place where he could eat safely with friends and associates. From what we hear, it was also quite the attraction for the show business crowd, drawn by the allure and mystery of the notorious gangster such stars of the 1920s as Eddie Cantor, Sophie Tucker, and Charles Buddy Rogers were often invited by. A suave, handsome band leader, Buddy Rogers was also a famous leading man, the star of Wings, the first Academy Award winning movie. Buddy was married to America's sweetheart, the late Mary Pickford, for 45 years. And he made news again just recently when he won the Gene Herschel Humanitarian Award at the Oscars. One aspect of your career, though, that people don't know much about is the fact that at one time you met the notorious Scarface Al Capone. He was my pal. Was he? Tell me how that happened. Well, I was playing the Chicago Theater, in Chicago, of course, back in the 30s, mid-30s. And uh, our manager was named Leo, motion picture Leo, of the theater. And he was in my dressing room, and I said, why do they call you motion picture Leo? He says, because, buddy, I furnished motion pictures to the great Al Capone. I said, what? He said, uh, would you like to meet him? Well, I said, I read about the headlines today in the paper, this morning's paper, of course I would. He goes to the phone, he dials a certain number. Hello? Big Chief, this is motion picture Leo. I've got Buddy Rogers with me this week. He and his mother are here, appearing five times a day. Tomorrow night, dinner for them. I'll have him there. Here I'm invited to, mother and I are invited to dinner with Al Capone over the phone like that. Is that right? He sent two or three Cadillac 16s <laughs> in the alley, in the alley, the stage door of the Chicago Theater. And mother and I, motion picture Leo, came out, got in these cars, and we drove 15 to 20 blocks, or maybe a 22nd block, maybe. Big hotel, west to south side of the town. And we got out, we went in the lobby, and I saw it was filled with men, the entire lobby. They were all reading newspapers. <laughs> they'd drop and look, who's, then they'd go back. <laughs> they were henchmen. I didn't know it. We went to the elevator. We went to the third or fourth floor. Motion picture Leo gets out and walks over to a door and presses a button. Motion picture Leo, I've got Mrs. Rogers and Buddy. The door opened, and I walked in, and I looked over there, and there was Al Capone. I noticed the room, there were a couple of men sitting there, and he says, oh, Mrs. Rogers and Buddy, I want you to meet... 
congressman so-and-so and senator so-and-so. <laughs> And he was also in politics, it looked like to me. He certainly was. He was charming with Mother. Couldn't have been nice. Not at all frightening to you? Not at all. He said, Mother Rogers, don't believe all these newspaper articles. I don't, I'm not a killer. I'm an, I don't want to hurt anyone, he said. And, and no, uh, no fear or intimidation? No fear. He loved the movies. He loved, says, hey, do you know Gary Cooper? I said, sure, we just made a film. He, Please have him come by. I love all you guys out, out in Hollywood. Please let me be a friend of, to all of you. But you thought of him almost as a co-celebrity, didn't you, buddy? That's right. Okay, uh, nothing really new and exciting to report yet. We're still digging. No new uh, spectacular ponds yet. But uh, stay with us. When we come back, we're going to visit Capone's secluded Miami mansion. And we're going to talk about an atrocity that came to be known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. After these commercial messages. So Scarface headed for Miami. Because of his notorious reputation, Al Capone could not find a second home. As you can imagine, no city in the country really wanted the guy. Finally, because of Florida's unique real estate laws, Capone's attorneys were able to buy this secluded mansion without revealing who the real purchaser was. By the time they found out, Scarface Al Capone was a legal Miami resident, the original Miami Vice. The present owner of the Palm Island house is Hank Morrison, an airlines pilot. Did you know it was the notorious Al Capone's place when you bought it? No, I didn't. It was just, uh, I needed a house and it was for sale and looked like a nice buy at the time. How'd you react when you find out? Well, I kind of enjoyed it. How so? Well, it's nice to live in a little bit of history. Uh-huh, it is history. How about tourists and tour buses and things like that? You get uh, any of that? Yeah, we get a few tour boats come by every day, a couple of them, and a few tourists ride by, but they're no big problem. Describe the place. We have the, the one uh, guest house that we were up into. That was where he used to keep the guards. And of course, this is the main house. Many people think that uh, Capone died in prison, but uh, actually he didn't. He uh, served uh, almost eight years, the last uh, uh, six years or so, in Alcatraz. And uh, he served his full sentence, and then he came back here, and he lived here with his family. And uh, he had, a, I guess, a brain hemorrhage uh, back in 47, and he actually died back in the, the old master bedroom in the house. It's, uh, like I say, a little bit of history, and uh, it, it doesn't give me any problem. I haven't seen any ghosts or anything. In 1929, working out of his mansion in Miami, Al Capone allegedly masterminded one of the most infamous murders in American gangland history, an atrocity that came to be known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. There used to be a single-story red brick garage and warehouse on this site back then, known as the SMC Cartage Company. The building was often used for bootleg booze deliveries by Capone's principal rival, Bugs Moran. Moran had succeeded Dion O'Banion and Jaime Weiss as leader of the Northside Irish Gang. The illegal booze trucks used to come right in that alley. As you know, Scarface Al had already eliminated O'Banion and Weiss. Now he set his sights on Bugs Moran. Early on the morning of February 14th, St. Valentine's Day, a police squad car pulled up on Clark Street across from the warehouse. Inside were four men. Two in plain clothes, two wearing police officers' uniforms. They left their car, walked across the street, and entered the warehouse, where seven of Bugs Moran's men were waiting for an illegal liquor delivery. Bugs was supposed to be there, but arriving late, he saw what looked like police officers entering his building. Wisely, he decided to stay down the block, watching, waiting, listening. Well, he didn't have long to wait. The extent of the bloody massacre became known, Bugs Moran was even motivated to break the underworld's rigid code of silence. He said, quote, only Al Capone kills like that. These historic photographs of the massacre were taken by Tony Berardi. He was one of the first photographers on the scene that fateful day. How did you feel when you walked in and you saw something like that, Tony? It's an incredible, gory scene. 
it didn't bother me a bit. What the hell? It didn't hurt me. Uh, and I've come, and we we have photograph. We've I've had photographed so many people um, killed, found in ditches and whatever. You become hardened to it. To me, it was a job. To me, it was to get in there and make make some four or five fast pictures and get the hell out of there. Did you think Capone did it? Did I think that Capone? I, did he have something to do with it? Yeah. Yes, I I, I do. Um, but Capone, uh, we learned the next day or two days later that he was down in Florida uh, at his home. As a matter of fact, there was a, a Chicago Tribune photographer by the name of Louis Wolf made a picture of Al Capone on, the, on his boat with the American flag flying. No, I have a definite idea who did it. Tell me. Well, Jack McGurn was one. Jack McGurn and Ralph Pierce. They were the only two gangsters that Capone had that could could have done a thing like this. So you have no doubt in your mind, Tony, but that this guy, Machine Gun Jack McGurn, was the architect or the main gunner in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre? No doubt. You know, Louise Ralph, the so-called blonde alibi, swears to this day that Jack had nothing to do with it. I don't care what she said. They tried to say that he was in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And that's when we, when I got all the notoriety because even though I wasn't married to him, I swore up and down he was in the Hotel Stevens with me at the time, which he was. I know I said what a horrible thing it was and it wasn't long after that that they came knocking on the door. Who was they? The police. What did they say to your husband? Just come with me. <laughs> they started questioning him then? Not in the room, no. They questioned me and I told him it was impossible. He could not have been there. And why not? Because he was there with me. Was it his custom to spend most nights at home? Oh, yes, huh? And he was definitely with you that Oh, night. definitely. So the blonde alibi is the truth. The truth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so help you, God. So help me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was right hand, pardon me. <laughs> Machine Gun Jack McGurn. Whether or not he did it will never be known. He was murdered exactly seven years later, on February 13th, 1936, the day before mm. Valentine's Day. Left behind, uh, right beside Jake McGurn's bullet-riddled body was a uh, mocking St. Valentine's Day card. The uh, cops kept it. Quote, you've lost your job, you've lost your dough, your jewels and handsome houses, but things could be worse, you know. You haven't lost your trousers. So nobody could uh, accuse these uh, racket guys of not having a macabre sense of humor. Now, when we come back, aside from updating you on the digging that continues even as I speak, we're going to show you a little reported side of, of Scarface Al. It's Al Capone, the humanitarian. I know it doesn't sound right, but that's after these commercial messages, so stay with us. Right. The mystery of Al Capone's vaults will continue after these messages. Al Capone may have been a murdering animal, but he was also a cunning businessman, one acutely aware of the need for good public relations. So despite his millions, for years he lived in this relatively modest home on the south side of town. Here, it's said, he was sincerely interested in the health and well-being of his sickly young son. He was also involved in the welfare of this community. He was the kind of guy, for example, who often gave Apple vendors $10 tips. He bought blocks of baseball tickets for entire Boy Scout troops, and he lobbied successfully for a milk dating ordinance to ensure that Chicago's kids would never be forced to drink spoiled milk. Public enemy number one also contributed money to build this school called St. Attractus, and he often played Santa at his neighborhood church during Christmas time. By 1929, the effects of the Great Depression were painfully visible throughout Chicago. Tens of thousands were unemployed, and many were going hungry. Al Capone had problems of his own. The depression cut deeply into his income. Elliot Ness had stepped up his devastating brewery raids. And Frank Wilson's tax fraud team was becoming an annoying threat. Eager to improve his public image, Capone proclaimed to the press that he wasn't a criminal, just a humble supplier of the booze everybody wanted. He also set up soup kitchens to feed Chicago's poor and hungry. 
I was for Ben Al Capolio, who wrote and opened this here White House on 935 South State Street. We were neat. Did he have an almost Robin Hood image? I believe it was a public relations gimmick, but he would go through the poor areas and, and pat little Italian kids on the head and, and pass out money. And, and uh, he just, uh, I think he consciously cultivated that particular thing. But image aside, Scarface Al was a brutal man. There were these two uh, characters. Well, that's what Selmy and Scalise. They were two tough characters. Well, well they, they were really the enforcers, Al Capone's enforcers. Um, course, I have two pictures here. This is the before and here's the after. Oh, here they are. There was a rumor going around that they were going to take, they were going to get rid of Al Capone and they were going to take over. Maybe that's why they ended up on the uh, slab here. That's, well, and now... And now uh, oh, yeah, that's right. These are the guys Al Capone beat to death. With a baseball bat. All things considered, Scarface Al Capone was probably one of the most charming and generous mass murderers of his time. Okay, uh, we're still digging. Nothing to write home about yet. But uh, we've still got 23 minutes. Who knows? When we come back from this next commercial, we're going to tell you the exciting, some might say, melancholy story of the decline and fall of Scarface Al Capone. And of course, we'll tell you what's happening in the fall after these commercial messages. The mystery of Al Capone's vaults will continue. By 1930, violent death had become almost a way of life here in Chicago. There had been so many mob murders, they no longer attracted much attention from either the public or the press. But on June 9th of that year, 1930, a murder committed right here near the public library infuriated the city and recaptured page one. At the time it happened, it was the 11th murder in 10 days in Chicago. But this one was different. This time the victim was not just another mobster. In fact, it was Jake Lingle, ace crime reporter for the Chicago Tribune. Early that fatal afternoon, Lingle took some time off to go to the racetrack. He left his offices in the Tribune two blocks away and walked to this very newsstand where he bought a copy of the daily racing form. Scanning the paper and lighting up a cigar, he walked into this pedestrian tunnel. It's right under Michigan Avenue. The steps were crowded then as they are today. So Jake Lingle apparently didn't see or sense the approach of a tall blonde guy, shoving people aside as he came up fast from behind. As the reporter walked down this ramp on his way to the subway, the tall blonde guy caught up, took a pistol from his pocket, and put a single bullet through Jake Lingle's brain. The Daily Race Inform didn't give him any luck that day. Still clutching the paper in his hand, the smoking cigar still clenched in his teeth, Jake Lingle fell dead right here. The reaction to the crime was immediate. The public was outraged and the press declared war on the mob. Instead of killing one of their own, they had murdered an innocent civilian. Now as things turned out, the reporter wasn't all that innocent. In fact, he was a corrupt, highly paid liaison between Capone and the cops. But that fact came out later, when it did nothing to diminish Chicago's newfound determination to put an end to mobster violence. Like Jake Lingle, Al Capone was reaching the end of the line. For the first time in his career, the long arm of the law was making Al Capone nervous. The heat was on. In the summer of 1930, his brother Ralph was sentenced to three years in prison. The crime, income tax evasion. In a phony dentist office on the second floor of this building across the street from the Lexington, Capone's trusted accountant kept his secret books. His name was Jake Greasy Thumb Guzik, and he was the next gang member to be indicted for income tax evasion. Frank Nitti, Capone's brutal enforcer, was also indicted on that same charge. And in the summer of 1931, Al Capone himself was charged with more than 20 counts of income tax evasion. In October of that year, he arrived at the Chicago Federal Court building to stand trial, brought there not by Elliot Ness, but by Frank Wilson, after years of careful examination of nearly two million documents, the work of Frank Wilson and his U.S. Treasury Department tax team was about to pay off. On October 24th, 1931, Al Capone was found guilty of deliberately evading the payment of federal income tax. Now ain't that a laugh. A man gets a drop on Capone and Capone doesn't even know what he looks like. Hey, this is the bull that finally brought me in on the income tax rack. 
On a chilly night in May of 1932, Al Capone boarded the train that would take him to the Atlanta Penitentiary in Georgia. His violent career as the ruler of Chicago's underworld had finally and unceremoniously ended. For nearly two years, though, in Atlanta's federal penitentiary, Capone lived in relative comfort. As a famous gangland potentate, he commanded a certain respect. With his ample supplies of cash, he also bought privileges and favors. In the summer of 1934, though, that all came to an end when Capone joined 52 of Atlanta's most dangerous and hardened prisoners on a special heavily guarded prison train. Its destination, Alcatraz. Authorities were so worried about an attempt to spring Capone that the prisoners never left the closely guarded cars. They were rolled onto a barge and towed to Alcatraz Island. When Al Capone first set foot on this 12-acre rock right in the middle of San Francisco Bay, he must have felt a sense of foreboding. He was, of course, no stranger to prison walls, but this place, Alcatraz, was frighteningly different. It was converted from an aging military jail into a medieval maximum security prison. Harsh, disciplined, escape-proof. And the notorious Scarface Al Capone would be one of its first official residents. The principle of rehabilitation did not apply in Alcatraz. The rock was designed for punishment and for total isolation from the mainland, just a mile and a half away. And the rock's boast that it was escape-proof was well-founded. The island is surrounded by barbed wire. Sewer outlets and utility tunnels which opened to the water were blocked. And then there's the swift, cold currents of San Francisco Bay, a formidable natural barrier that did as much as the walls to keep people in. From six towers, every square foot of the island could be watched, and each tower was equipped with high-powered rifles. No one would get off the rock. When Warden James A. Johnson called his infamous name, Capone, was led through the three steel doors that secured the cell house reception area. Name? <laughs> you. What's your name? You know my name. Everybody knows my name. Well, then you ought to know it, too. Capone! First name? Alphonse. Number 85. Next. Capone was then led to the bathhouse, where he was strip-searched and medically examined. There, he traded in his trademark hat and overcoat for his gray denim prison uniform. Suddenly, he was no longer Lord of Chicago. He was simply prisoner number 85. Al Capone was led to his second-story cell. A space nine by five by seven. It was probably smaller than his closet in the Lexington Hotel. It would be Al Capone's home for almost the next five years. At 6.30 every morning, a bell would signal the beginning of Al Capone's day. Then, like every other con in this place, he had approximately 20 minutes to dress and shave. If he wanted to shave, the procedure was approximately this. He would put an empty matchbox right here. A guard coming by would put a razor blade inside. Capone and the other prisoners would then have three minutes to complete their shave at which time the guard would pick up the razor blade. A second bell would then signal the beginning of the daily prisoner count, followed closely by a third bell, calling the men to breakfast. One February morning in 1938, Capone walked out of his cell seemingly in a daze. He walked aimlessly and mechanically down this corridor. He was wearing his Sunday uniform instead of his appropriate workday clothes, and he even failed to fall into line when ordered. The man was completely confused. Here in the medical ward, the prison doctor noted that Capone's speech was thick and slurred. That, along with his other symptoms, suggested central nervous system damage, characteristic of an advanced case of syphilis. And indeed, that was the case. You see, ten years earlier, in the Lexington Hotel, Capone's 18-year-old mistress was diagnosed as having the disease. At that time, Scarface was urged to be tested, but because of his pathological fear of needles, he refused. Well, a decade later, that refusal had come back to haunt him. How many years did you work here? To be exact, 29. I was here right after they opened it, in October the 27th, 1934. So you were here when Al Capone got here? I was here when he got here. Describe Capone's arrival here at Alcatraz. Say he came over on the barge with several other inmates, marched up the hill here, went into the clothing room, was given a change of clothes, given a bath, given a cell. 
That's all there was to it. His irons were removed. That was it. So they were marched up here in irons? In irons. Oh, absolutely. Leg irons and cuffs. Was he a big talker? No, I don't think so. He was kind of quiet. So the king of the Chicago underworld came to Alcatraz, just became another number. That's right. The mighty Capone was not a mighty Capone around here. He was just another inmate. He would spend the rest of his sentence in the prison's hospital, gradually deteriorating until he had become a pathetic shell of his former self. Finally, on January 6, 1939, not quite five years after arriving here, Capone walked down this dock to the boat that would take him off the island. What was left of Scarface Al Capone was going home. In 1940, Al Capone returned to his home on Palm Island after serving his prison sentence. The progressive effects of neurosyphilis now ravaged his body. And one of his oldest and most loyal associates described Capone to the press as being nutty as a fruitcake. During much of that period, Emery Zurich worked here as a security guard. What was your basic job? Uh, mostly to keep away in the reporters. There used to be hundreds of reporters here at one time. And keep uh, writers and anybody who wanted to sightsee us, keep them moving. Did you have a lot of people trying to get in? Oh, always, always. That was the biggest headache with the job. What kind of shape was Al in? Very bad. He was practically bedridden. Every once in a while, they'd take him out to the uh, uh, dock over here and he'd do some fishing. The, nurse, the male nurse would push him out there in a wheelchair. Uh -huh. He'd always have a bathrobe on, right. stay out there, depending on the weather. It was brisk, he'd move him in. If not, he'd just stay out there. Any of the racket guys come by to visit him? Oh, loads and loads and loads of them. Like who? Uh, it was Tony Arcado and uh, Charlie really? Fischetti's. Yeah, the, quite a few that I don't remember offhand right now. How about his brother, Ralph? Ralph was here all the time. Ralph was the supervisor. Why'd you take the job with such a notorious guy? Well, at that time, uh, the police department used to uh, just operate mainly in the winter at full strength. In the summer, they'd lay off everybody. You've got to remember, this was just a little town in those days. So the uh, chief of police asked me if I wanted an extra job. Uh, so I volunteered. He said, get a uniform and see Ralph Capone. So I got that, and that was the assignment. So was Capone that. treated with respect? Yeah. Everybody treated him with respect in the households there. Yeah. The nurses and everybody else. Well, he was a very sick man, very thin and very sick. He died quietly? Yeah, it was one evening he just died. They just got the word downstairs that he had passed away. So that was it. On the evening of January 25th, 1947, his body and brain destroyed by syphilis, the man who would be king of the Chicago underworld passed away at his mansion in Miami. Al Capone was just 48 years old. His body is buried here at the Mount Carmel Cemetery just outside Chicago, where it rejoins what's left of Dion O'Banion, Jaime Weiss, Diamond Joe Esposito, and many, many others Scarface Al sent here before him. Unlike the other gang leaders, Capone was buried without fanfare. His wife, May, and a few friends were the only mourners present. He had no official pallbearers. His casket was carried to the gravesite by the same men who dug his grave. I don't quite know how to tell you this at uh, eight minutes to the hour, but we found another wall in there. I wonder if I can get a deposit on a 60-year-old bottle. All right. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. We'll see what we got here. The mystery of Al Capone's vaults will continue after these messages. this vault nearly two hours ago. We had no real idea what we'd find inside. As it turns out, we haven't found very much, at least not, uh, not yet. In any case, I think that... Uh, Kill the answer to uh, A legend, a half century old or so, has been resolved. I don't know if we've gone far enough. I mean, we found the other wall over there. There may be more to be discovered, maybe, maybe not. We found the secret tunnel. We found the hidden stairways. We found the other private spaces. We talked to a lot of people, you know, older people whose memories I think would have otherwise been uh, forever lost if it wasn't for this program. It seems 
At least up to now that we've struck out with the vault, I'm disappointed about that, as I'm sure you are. This is one time in my life that a uh, pot of gold would have been a lot more fun than uh, chasing the rainbows. In any case, uh, you get a wide shot. Show my team here. They work their hearts out. You know, come on there, guys. All right. Uh, you know, all right. But yeah, I guess that's uh, Claire, Claire's uh, Claire picture. All right. Now, uh, I hope you've enjoyed the adventure of the chase. You know, to briefly review, we found some bottles. We found, we found some other artifacts. The tunnels, uh, or rather the vaulted space, did date back to uh, the time of Scarface Al Capone. Uh, but, I don't know, our seismic or sonic tests must have uh, been uh, slightly awry because we didn't find the uh, much heralded hollow spaces that we were led to believe were in there. Um, so, uh, what can I say? I'm sorry. I want to thank my buddies here for doing the job. Uh, thank you for watching. I promised all the critics that if we didn't find anything, I'd sing a song. So, uh, uh, Chicago, Chicago, that toddling town. All right, I'm going. I'll see you. Good night. I'm sorry. See you next time. Take it easy. On State Street, that great street, I just want to sing. The mystery of Al Capone's vaults has been brought to you by Budweiser. Each wood aged for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. And by the good products and good people at the Quaker Oats Company. Accommodations by Hyatt Regency Chicago. Overlooking the beautiful lakefront on the magnificent mile near convenient shopping and sightseeing. Air transportation by Jet America. The airline that gives you that personal touch. Rental cars by Dollar Rent-A-Car, Chicago O'Hare.